let's talk about transformations. I should just put these together in one slideshow. But, but I haven't, and I'm not going to. I say that every year, I go through it. So, okay. This is this one here is a little, I mean, the, the post hoc one we just talked about. Just a minute. Same thing with this one. It's about just, it's about the idea, the notion here that this is something one could do. So sometimes we look at our data with an exploratory data analysis, which you should always start that way. Always start with EDA. And we run the ANOVA and we get nothing. So you do your ANOVA and you get like, and then you look it up at the probability that the P is uh, greater than 0.05, and that's when you go, oh no. But when you look at your graph, you see the means are wildly different. You're like, well, why didn't it find it? It didn't find a difference. And there is, I know there's a difference here. I can see it. I think I told you the other day that, uh, this might have been when we were remote, but my PhD advisor always said the statistics are there to, to, to tell you what you already know. You should have been able to look at your data and say, I know what happened here. I'm typically not that interested in effects that have to be pull that data to the point where I can't see it just on a graph, but if I did enough things to the numbers, they'll, they'll tell me. Again, as I uh, keep talking with Dr. Spence, seeing Spence, the guy that taught me stats in grad school, but he used to say, you know, if the numbers will give anything you want, and they can torture them enough, they'll tell you anything. Numbers don't really come from. You can screw around with all you want, and eventually you'll find something that fits your hypothesis. That's not what you want to do. But sometimes you look at something and go, there's something here, but it's not showing up. It's like Bob Dylan. You know, there's something happening, but you don't know what it is. That was literally just for me. The best guess here is we have viol violated an assumption. So remember, all the math behind the analysis of variance has these assumptions built in. So we probably violated the assumption. And it's usually variance. You cannot mathematically fix violating the assumption of independence of events. That's not something you can fix. You, the way you fix that is you don't do a NOVA. So that's not a good fix. Um, you can't fix random selection, like random sampling. But you know what? Violating random sampling is something you can violate the crap out of. Yourself. And it doesn't matter. You can really badly violate um, normally distributed. You can violate that to hell. To the point of you can have zeros and ones if you So that you find them. That's figured out by doing what are called Monte Carlo experiments, they're just simulations where people just generate data. They actually know the population distribution, but they generate data by sampling. And they use maybe a million possible combinations, and they find out that it doesn't really vary from when we violate, haven't violated those that assumption. But you can't, so you can't but fix this with the independence of this, but variance, what's called the homogeneity of variance assumption. That all the variances are equal. You don't want to violate that, but you can maybe fix that. And the rule of thumb is, and I, I think I said this when we talked about t tests is one variance four times bigger than another. If, if that's the case, that's usually a case where you go, eh, it's a little bit bad. T -test, oh, sorry, F tests are pretty robust when it comes to violating the assumption of uh, the homogeneity of variance assumption. They're pretty robust. But at some point it breaks down, math breaks down. So let's fix it. Let's, let's make the variances the same. Ooh, you like that transition? It was different. I enjoyed that. I, however, am quite easily entertained. So what can we do? What you do is you transform your data through some sort of mathematical operation. Through some sort of mathematical operation, you change your numbers. Now, this isn't the mathematical operation where you say, well, they're not different enough, so I'm going to add 17 to all the numbers in this group. That's called making up your data. That's called academic misconduct. That's the kind of thing that gets you fired. That's the kind of thing that gets you kicked out of school. Don't make up your data. It's not worth it. 
You'll hear people say this. This isn't right. You can't do that. The numbers say this. And my response to them is, sure, it's fair. And why do I think that's fair when I just said, you know, you can't just take one group and add 17 to it? You're just changing the units. So if I said, if I looked at all these numbers and I said, I don't like these numbers, they're, 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 I don't like the way they, they, they're distributed, I'm going to change that, and I'm going to change it like this. I'm going to multiply, I'm going to multiply it times 5 ninths and subtract 32. At what point, just from listening to you so far, yeah. we're just making it easier to interpret the data. We're, we're making it easier to find the difference we, we're pretty sure is there. Okay. And we're changing the units. And if I multiply times 5 ninths, or even better, multiply times 5, divide by 9, and then take the result and subtract 32, you know what I've done? Anybody listen to the radio ever? Probably no anymore. If you hear a news report from across the river, they report the temperature in freedom units instead of Celsius, like the rest of the known world. I'm sorry, Fahrenheit. Right? They use Fahrenheit, we use Celsius because we're sensible ish. If you take a Fahrenheit and you multiply Fahrenheit temperature multiply times five times five nights and then subtract 32, you get Celsius. Is Celsius more or less a measure of temperature than Fahrenheit? No, it's just another way of looking at it. You re-express units all the time. Have you ever bought something from an American website? Of course you have. And you look and you say, okay, uh, I have to change this to Canadian dollars and how much I'm really paying. So you look and go, what's our dollar worth right now? It's, it's uh, I don't know, whatever the hell it's worth, 81 cents American. You convert. You're just changing the units. So it's completely fair. There's nothing wrong with doing this. And my favorite one is looking at Celsius to Fahrenheit or vice versa because it sounds really like I'm doing something sketchy. And I'm not doing something sketchy. Right? So and to convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit, you multiply times 9 fifths and add 30. They're, they're measuring the same thing. It's just not a different scale. We do this all the time. So there's nothing wrong with this, but it might, and this is what we talked about this. We were assigned one, and I, and I asked you, if, does the distribution change when you convert from uh, centimeters to inches? And I gave the marks, full marks, if you said yes, or if you said no, you're saying, Dave, wait, that can't be true. Well, the num it does bunch things up because the numbers are smaller, and that's true. So if you said that, that's fine. And then other people said it does that, but they're all still measuring height. So it, it doesn't change the distribution of heights. That's also true. So the raw numbers change, but the thing it's measuring doesn't change. So that's one of those cases where literally both those things are true. Like, like both interpretations are false. All we're doing here is changing units. And that's what I'm talking about. So here's the first one, log transformation. So it's taking the logarithm of a number. Do you remember what logarithms are? Do you need to teach logarithms in 40 seconds? Put your hand up if you do it. Don't be embarrassed. Thank you. Easy to do. OK. This is literally the worst eraser in the history of erasers for black boys. Oh, yeah, you can't tell what that says now. It's completely gone. So, and I'm going to just use a simple base 10 logarithm. Um, we would typically actually use base e, but let's just do base 10 because it illustrates a lot. Okay, the log base 10 of 100 is 2, 10 is 1. And let's go with the low. Etc. So the base 10 log of 100 is 2, the base 10 log of 10 is 1, the base 10 log of 0 is 1, the base 10 log of 1,000 is 3. All you're doing is this. 
squared first and to the zero, you probably do remember that taking something to the zero exponent makes it one. It's just one of those things. It, yeah, it makes sense in a wacky sort of way. But yeah. Okay, Q is a thing. So what you're doing is you're finding what the exponent is. Okay? And you can see what that's going to do. It's going to turn everything into much big numbers really small. It sucks them way down. Way more than it sucks down small numbers. And we use logarithmic scales all the time. Decimals, right? Decibels are a logarithmic scale. 70 decibels is 10 times louder than 60 decibels. 140 decibels, which is so loud that you will perforate your eardrum, is 10 times louder than 130 decibels, which is about as loud as you can take and not be completely uncomfortable when you're listening to music, uh, 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 seeing a band, and you're standing right by the PA. That's what 130 is. 140 will, you'll, you're, you're, you'll bleed out of your ears. That's how loud it is in uh, an airport. When there's jet planes, you see all the people wearing ear, ear protection. So we use Richter scale for earthquakes. The Richter scale of here, because if you don't live in anywhere with an earthquake, you probably don't know this. So you see, for example, there's one in the one in San Francisco. Somebody Google how big the San Francisco earthquake was in 19. 90, or 1989 or 90? What the, what, what, how big it was? So you can do that. Well, the first person to tell us how big the earthquake was. 6.9. Yeah, 6.9. Very good. A 6.9. We had an earthquake here. What? About six years ago, there was a very small earthquake. It was, wasn't centered here, it was centered west. And it was about a four. But it was nothing. It was like this. My wife was teaching French at the, the federal government at the forestry center, and she felt it there. I didn't feel it at all. We live that way, about four kilometers. That was like four. And you say, the San Francisco one that caused all those that horrible damage and stopped the World Series game and all those other things. It's only 2.9 more. No, that means it's, oh, let's, let's make it seven, we're going to round it. That means it's a thousand times more. Because Richter scale is a long scale. Uh, when you look at exponential growth from viruses, I don't know where I got that example from. That's, you know, the best way to look at that is a log scale. So we use logarithmic units all the time. So let's take the log of something. So any exponential curves like reaction time, like growth of viruses. Think about reaction time. When it gets to the very end, there's going to be a lot more variance than there's a very, very small end, right? Negative values are a problem. You can't take a logarithm of anything zero or less. They're undefined. They don't exist. Those numbers. The way you fix that is first you add a constant. So let's say you've got a minus five in there. Just add six to all the numbers, then take the log. So in that case, it's the log of x plus k. You're also typically, we aren't going to be using log base 10. I just did that for illustrative purposes. We typically would use log of the base e, which is sometimes known as ln, because it's ln. It's the natural logarithm. It's log to the base e. It's just like e's a mathematical constant like pi or something like that. It's 2.71828, nothing. So what, oftentimes, what you would typically use is you, you'd use natural log. Reaction times, it's great. I've had a couple of times when students have been doing their honors thesis with me, they use reaction times as variables. And they come and they said to me, I didn't get a significant analysis of variance. And I said, let's look at your graphs. And I look at it and say, don't you notice how much of this variance is in that one? And they say, yes, but I don't know what to do. And I say, how did you pass that class you took with me last year? Remember? 
we're going to, I mean, usually it's just me going, okay, we should create another variable, make it the natural logarithm, but oh, look, it worked. Questions about logarithms for the square root? Okay, square root, we probably know what square roots are. This is used a lot with counted data. I'm not going to go into why. I don't know that it's necessary here. Um, so how many of this are in this group? How many, how many? Just counting how many. Number correct, number of correct response, number of words recalled. It's a very common independent or dependent variable, right? So a lot of times we have counted data. Taking the square root fixes it. This is when the means are proportional to the variance. So the bigger the mean gets, the bigger the variance gets that you can actually graph it and get a straight line. And that's, that tends to happen with counted data. That tends to happen with counted data. It should make some sense when you think about it, I guess, because if the average in some group is one correct, there's not going to be a lot of variance. Right? There's not going to be a lot of variance. If there's a lot, if there's a higher number, there's more going to be more variance. So it means to be proportional to the variance. And square roots fix this. You might want to add a constant first because, again, we don't want to deal with negative numbers. You can take the square root of negative numbers, but they're imaginary numbers, and I don't know how you use that, but imaginary numbers. Excuse me. So, so if you've got some negative numbers, just add a constant. Same thing with the water. And then take the square root. Reciprocal transformation is another great one. This is just flipping the number over. So if it's two thirds, now it's three halves. Right? Just reciprocal. This makes the range much smaller, so the variance gets smaller. Because it's going to suck big numbers way down compared to small numbers. It's going to make small numbers get bigger. Right? Okay. Now, this is good with latencies, so time. Time to complete a task. Well, it's turning time into speed. We do that all the time. Think about it. We, we say, how long does it take to get to? Like, it would take me to get here from home on my bike. It takes about 12 minutes. How fast am I going? Well, it's five kilometers, so I can do that. Five miles per hour, right? So we do this all the time, actually. The unit we use for, we don't use latency differently, we use speed. Right? How fast are you going? Not how long is it going to take to get there. Well, sometimes people will say, how, how far away is something? And some people will say, well, two hours. Right? This is another one that I've had students, uh, honor students over the years. I mean, I've had people do all these things. I've, I've had, when I applied for promotion a couple of years ago, I had to count up all the people who were doing other pieces with me. The age 97. So it's been a lot. I can do this a lot. Um, and I've had people with the same thing. Wait, wait, oh, look, Dave, it didn't work. It's like just it's latency. Reciprocal, come on. Oh, yeah. So you're just turning, running, it's turning time into speed. It's no big deal. This, so, so far, I think they're all kind of sensible. They have an intuitive appeal. This is the weird one. And in fact, this is the one that I've used the most in my career and that I've had my students use the most. And this is with proportions because I deal a lot with percent correct. I deal a lot with percent correct. And when you think about percentages, you end up with Big bunch in the middle, and very few perfect and very few zero. So the, if you look at the distribution, it kind of looks like this. It's the distribution of variances, which is an odd thing to think of, but it ends up looking kind of like a football, you know, Canadian football, American football, rugby ball, if you want to use a different cultural ball. This fixes this. And it stretches out the ends, 
holds the football, instead of being fat in the middle, it makes it more like uh, the profile of a hockey puck. And it's not just the arc sign. Um, and you're, you're saying, well, oh, that's what that weird button is in my calculator. It's two times the arc sign square root. And I'm going to level with you here. I don't know why that works. I can't remember enough trigonometry to remember why this, this pulls this like that. But it goes. So two times arc sign square root. Text is this. I would never ask you which one to use on a test or something. That's, I mean, I could, because you don't, they're open book tests and all that stuff. But even on the quizzes where you don't have all your resources, I'm going to ask you what transformation is. I'm going to ask you the individual ones. So two arc sine square root. And it fixes proportions. Now, the question you might ask is, when do I, and there are others. These, I just ran over, the, I guess, the four most popular, the four you run into. When do you transform your data? You don't always do it. It's not like something you do as a matter of course. You don't say, well, it didn't work. Let's see if I just keep throwing mathematical procedures at these numbers that they'll find something. That's not how you do it. It's a case of when you violated the homogeneity of variance assumption. Every year at the honors thesis presentations, uh, the students practice their talks to all of us before any of you hear them. And they practice them, and they practice them, and they practice them. And I'm known for a couple of things when they do their practice. I'm known for this. Do you have any, where are there any error bars in your graphs? The first thing I ask, and the next one is, have you tried transforming your data? I believe you violated the assumption of homogeneity of variance. And it's to the point where my colleagues actually laugh because they totally expect you to do it. And almost eh, one person every year does it. A lot of people don't do this and don't think about it. And I've had, again, a number of occasions where I've been a reviewer of an article for a journal. And people run something and it doesn't, like, they have three or four experiments and one doesn't work and they're at a loss. And I said, just transform the data, it'll be fine. I'm sure of it. So the variances are messy. Use the guidelines I've given you today and pick the right one and try it. Um, it may very well save a project. That said, if your data don't violate any assumptions, you don't transform. So I had a case with using proportions when I was in grad school. Uh, well, there were percentages, which are still proportions. And my PhD advisor said, why didn't you transform your data? I said, I didn't have to. It worked. It's a little messy, but it worked. Why make my article more, a little more confusing to people who weren't very mathematically sophisticated? Right? Stuff they should know that a lot of people don't know. So I'm just going to leave this because it worked. And I'm saying, well, I can go do it and show you that it still works, but I don't see where that. She was like, OK, no. Now, you always present untransformed data. So when you do a graph, because if I look at a graph of percent correct, I know what that means. I know 100% is perfect, zero is, is, is not perfect. And if, and if you've got four alternatives, I know 25 is chance. If you have two alternatives, I know 50 is chance. But I know that, I, I just, because that's just how the world works. I don't know what two times the arc sine square root of 25 is if I'm looking for chance and it's four alternatives. I just don't know that. That's not a thing that, that's not intuitive. Graphs are supposed to, they're for communication, right? You're presenting data, it's communication. Analysis doesn't have, is, is about communication in a sense, but it's also trying to find stuff that's there that sort of needs to feed you into anything else. So you don't present untransformed data. You make it exceedingly clear in your results section of your paper that you transformed your data. You have to say that. And you say what the transformation is, and you say why you did it. But you don't present money. 
you don't present transformed data, nobody's going to understand what it means. Except for people, you know, can do trade in their head. I, I, I do know people like that. And I find them disturbing. It's a little weird. That you can, oh, you just know arc signs? That's weird. Okay, next. When I was in school, they did teach us squares of numbers up to 25 so we can do square roots a little bit in our head and all that. But that's why people sort of tail end of Gen X can still do things like that, like me. But um, they didn't teach us trig tables. <laughs> we didn't have to learn trig tables in our head. Questions about transformations? Yeah, no. OK. Because if you have nothing, that's fine. Well, I mean, generally, but it's not in my life. I'm really quite disturbed. Which means, again, I'm kidding. <laughs>